أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين speaker for today's commencement. It is our brother, Imam Muhammad Ibn Munir, who is also known as Mufti. Maybe he'll explain that, however, if you see the output this young man has on the internet, you'll realize for yourself why he's earned the name or nickname Mufti. It may soon be an actual title, if not already. People will often Asked me actually in the past years ago, people would ask me when I lived in Riyadh, did I know Mufti? Many people would ask me this, and I said, no, I always said no, I never met the man. It was as though he had left a strong impression. So it wasn't until many years later, here in College Park, that I actually became familiar with him somewhat through one of our Islamic studies teachers who was here today. He would use Imam Muhammad's uh, five minutes of faith, little video clips, five minutes only, to introduce some topics to his students. I think these students are, are familiar with them, some of the graduates here. Uh, I've seen since that time and listened to many of the innumerable lessons he has on YouTube, on his channel called Hadith Disciple, which is viewed worldwide and is indeed copious with Friday Khutbahs, lessons on fiqh, hadith, the tower, and even book reviews. Be sure to visit that channel, and I'm sure you will find great benefit, and you'll appreciate his elucidation as I have, inshallah. His chief area of study was the study of hadith of the lost messenger, so I said that. He's one of the relatively small number of men from the United States, being originally from Philadelphia, who has completed master's degree in hadith from the University of Medina. You can even see his final defense online. That was pretty brave. We are delighted that he has accepted our invitation to come here today. He's come all the way from New York City where he's, he's the Imam Esther Ahmasun of Jamaa. He's here to say a word to these young men and women and we appreciate that very much. As we know, he's in high demand and has many responsibilities. And pay attention, pay very close attention to him. You know, one of his techniques, if you will, or habits, is to make sure his audience is listening by asking you to repeat. And remember, this is being recorded. It's being what? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And alhamdulillah, na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudilla la. Wa man yudlil falahadiya la. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahduhu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdullahi wa rasooluh. أرسله الله تعالى رحمة للعالمين بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله تعالى بإذنه سبحانه وسراجا منيرا أما بعد سلام على من تبع الهدى Obviously everyone sitting here or at least I would say most of the people in attendance here today know the meanings or at worst the translation of what I just read and what I just recited. However, for those of us who may not know, those of us who may know just a bit, those of us who may know the translation, but not the actual full depth, the meaning, the symbolism, the seriousness of the words that we just recited, of the words that we just read. 
and to keep things simple and to keep things easy and to make things crystal clear, what I basically did was, and what I basically said was, I have no power. I have no knowledge. I have no strength. I have no ability to walk, to stand, to speak in front of you, except through Allah, with Allah, and by Allah. And I ask him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to protect me and to keep me safe from anything that I may say that is wrong, that's an error, anything that I may convey to you and pass on to you which may be misleading, which may be detrimental to your mind, your soul, or your body. What I basically said was, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning and in the end, for good and for bad, for prosperity and adversity, Allah alone, the Lord of the great throne, is the one who deserves to be thanked, is the one whose gratitude we must show and manifest and put forth in our statements, our actions, and our deeds. And that he alone, without any partner, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the one who made this sitting, this ceremony, this gathering, easy and simple. And if it wasn't for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it wouldn't be possible. And Allah, azza wa jal, he chose someone, someone who was very special, very unique. Rather, he chose a man who had no match, a man who had no peer, a man who had no equal from his contemporaries. There were men who were similar to him of the past. There were men he ate with, he traveled with, those whom he lived with. But in certain aspects, no one was ever like him, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he chose this man, and he guided this man, and he spiritually and physically and mentally cleansed this man to bear a mighty message, a weighty message. And this message of might and this message of weight is for Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped along without any partner. And for us to do all that is good, call others there too, and as my brother Khalil mentioned, to invite others and to help others and encourage others. He, Allah Azza wa sent this man Muhammad for this divine purpose. And that is the reason why we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, asking Allah to accept what he did, asking Allah Azza wa to give the highest of praise, the greatest of blessings to him and all men, all women, and all children, and all young men and young women as well, who allowed him to carry out that major duty that Allah placed upon his shoulders to proceed. I think the most appropriate thing that I can start my talk with today, be the night ta'ala, since we're in the month of Ramadan, and we're at a graduation ceremony, is one of the authentic hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. The well-known hadith, you all know, in Arabic, in English, in which the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he says something. In which Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala also says something. It is a hadith Nabawi and a hadith Qudsi. It's something that the Prophet ﷺ said from his own words. And it's also a special, unique, divine, holy, and pure narration in which he quotes Allah, the Lord of the Great Throne. And from the magnificent words that are given to us in this prophetic tradition is what the Prophet ﷺ says. Okay, the hadith is well known in Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, he tells us, those who fast, the one who fasts, the woman who fasts, the man who fasts, anyone who is a faster, a sa'im, has two major times of happiness. Two times in which he or she will enjoy happiness and you also will feel proud. The first the Prophet ﷺ says is the dunya. When it comes to something tangible, when it comes to something material, when it comes to something that you can see, you can experience in this life. And that is when you break your fast, you will be happy. The thirst goes away, the hunger goes away, the migraine goes away, the dryness of the mouth goes away. You eat, you drink, the coffee, the tea, the dates, the water, the fresh fruit, you are happy in this life. And the Prophet ﷺ, he also said, and when the faster, the fasting one, the fasting sister, the fasting brother, when he meets, when she meets, when you meet your Lord, you will be happy. And obviously the happiness when you meet Allah is going to be 
Allahu alam, how many times more than the happiness in this worldly life, fulfilling your desires and the necessary things of the human being, of food and of drink, of nourishment and of hydration. So you may ask, what does this have to do with the ceremony? Or what does it have to do with the young brothers and the young sisters, brother Khalil and sister Samira, and the list goes on, of the bright stars, those who have went on, those who will come, and those who are about to graduate right now, hopefully the answer is very clear. And that is you, your parents, your teachers, your instructors, everyone, anyone who had anything to do with your school, your education, your training, your cultivation, your nourishment, physical, mental, and spiritual. There lies no doubt, ta'ala, especially in the month of Ramadan, this hadith hopefully will apply to all of you. And that is, today you should be happy. Today you should be proud of all of the sacrifices that you put forth. Financial sacrifices, physical sacrifices, and the list goes on of the sacrifices that only Allah truly knows about. Each and every one of you should be happy and you should be proud. And secondly, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, greater than this, bigger than this, deeper than this, is the happiness that you should experience in your career. Is the happiness that you should experience when you walk away and you go and you take it to the next level of education, you take it to the next level of employment, you take it to the next level of marriage, of creating a family, of starting your own. Most importantly is the happiness in their after. And hopefully you will be from those people that the Prophet ﷺ said regarding another authentic hadith. سَبْعَةٌ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ذِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ذِلَّ إِلَّا ذِلُّهُ Seven people or seven types of people, seven classes of people, seven types of individuals who will enjoy Allah's shade, a day in which there's no shade except for that which Allah provides. And from these individuals, the Prophet ﷺ says, عَلِمَامُ adil. He says is the just ruler, the just leader. And he went on to say, And he said it in youth, a young man, a young woman who grew up worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A young Muslim from kindergarten, from preschool, from first grade all the way to 12th grade to graduation. So be the night ta'ala, you should be happy. You should rejoice. You should be grateful that Allah Azza selected you and chose you to get education, good education, quality education, and hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, to taste the sweetness of your labor and of your efforts. Amabat. That's not the main topic of my talk. And that's not the main thing that I want to speak about and share with you today. Uh, I normally don't like to write down things for several reasons. I normally choose to speak from my heart, speak from my mind. There's nothing wrong with a prepared speech. There's nothing wrong with reading from a paper or index card. Sometimes I read certain things. But sometimes I just like to talk and speak to you like you're my brother or my uncle or my father or my aunt or my mother or my little sister and talk to you and have a conversation with you. However, there are a few things that I did write down. There are a few things that I did jot down for a purpose. The first thing that I wrote down is the main topic, is the main theme of my brief speech. 25 minutes is not a lot of time. And hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, I won't take more than 25 minutes. And I called this speech in this title, I gave the title, Beacons of Light. Beacons of Light. Many of you, if not most of you, know what a beacon of light is. And some people, they say a beacon of hope. But for further clarification, and to really drive it home, inshallah ta'ala, I want to read the technical definition of a beacon of light. And I want to see, inshallah ta'ala, which one of you can understand and connect it and make it relate, inshallah ta'ala, to Al-Huda school. It states here in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a strong light that can be seen from far away and that is used to help and guide ships, airplanes, etc., Number two, a radio signal that is broadcast to help guide ships, airplanes, etc. Last but not least, someone or something such as a country that guides or gives hope to others. Listen to these words. A beacon of light is not a beam of light. It's not just a lighthouse. 
is not just a signal, but it's something that's strong. It's something that pierces. It's something that penetrates and cuts. It's something that provides a great amount of light. Or it's something that's heard, something that's audible, not something that you see that's visible, but a radio beam, a radio signal, and it has the following purposes. Number one, to guide. Number two, to give hope. Number three, to rescue. To guide, to give hope, and to rescue. So before this great beam of light can go out to the coast, to the sky, and pull in this large mass of tonnage and this mass of people to safety, to landing, to the shore, before it can do any of these things, Obviously, the light itself has to be strong. It has to be powerful. It has to be consistent. And it has to be clear and transparent. This light cannot be held back. It cannot become stuttered because of fog, because of clouds. The radio beam cannot be intercepted. It cannot become fuzzy. But it has to be something that goes directly from the source to its intended destination. And it guides someone. It brings them back and it gives them hope. When you think that you're lost, when you think that there's no way, there's no rescue, kalas is done. We've accepted our fate of death and injury. But this beam of light is sent out and it does and it carries this purpose. So this is what I thought, what I thought and what I felt to be extremely profound for myself and for all of you being the night ta'ala. And that Allah will make you all beacons of light. People who learned what was correct, people who studied, people who got the necessary education and training and don't later on hoard that knowledge and hide that knowledge or discard that knowledge or refrain from busying yourselves with that knowledge. Rather, you learn, you become guided, you become educated, you learn the proper etiquettes, you learn the proper spirituality and Allah Allah will send you in all parts of this city, this town, this state, this country, this globe, to guide others, and to teach others, regardless whether you're a pediatrician, whether you're a cardiologist, whether you're an athlete, a professional athlete, an entrepreneur, a businessman, whatever you do, that you call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you invite others, you give others hope, you teach others, you educate others through what you say, through what you do, through what you don't do, through that which you refrain from and abstain from. Everybody is not a good speaker. Everyone isn't a good public speaker. There are some of us who may read something from a paper and stutter and mispronounce and become nervous. Everyone isn't made to be in the forefront or the limelight, quote unquote. There are some of us who are going to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our actions, through our deeds, through silence. So ask yourself, are you a beam of light or are you a radio transmission? Which of the two are you? Can you be seen or can you be heard? Or can you be seen and can you be heard? Something that many of us have forgotten about, have lost the main focus and the main purpose of life. And one of the most important objectives for every single Muslim, especially a graduate of an Islamic school, of an Islamic institution, of an Islamic academy, and that is our responsibility to be and to become or to become and be and constantly be beacons of light. To call others to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When someone walks into your office, someone practices with you and plays with you, someone walks into your store, your neighbor, your coworker, your employer, your employee, all of the people that you come across in this modern world, they should receive some type of light from you. Whether they accept it, whether they take it, whether they utilize it, whether they land safely, whether they reach the shore or not, but you give it and you provide it. A da'wah ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling to Allah the mighty and the majestic, is the responsibility of every single Muslim. It is not the responsibility of the scholar. It is not the responsibility of the student of knowledge. It is not the responsibility of the imam or the teacher. It is the responsibility of the one in fifth grade, the one in the sixth grade, 
the one in the 12th grade, the one in college, the one who has a master's degree, the one who has a PhD. It is the responsibility of the football player, the soccer player, the cricket player. It is the responsibility of anything or any field of life that you go towards. It is your duty to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only is it your duty, not only is it your responsibility to be a beacon of light, but it's something that's fruitful. It's something that's virtuous. It's something that is going to reap a heavy, heavy reward. From those rewards is that which Allah Azza wa tells us in his glorious book. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَيْ لَلَّهِ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحَا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Allah says, and who is better in speech? What Muslima, what Muslim is better, is more thorough, is more excellent, is closer to me? What Muslim has a greater place in paradise than the one who calls to Allah, invites to Allah, than someone who sends out this light, who sends out this message, save yourselves, protect yourselves, deliver yourselves. Your job, your degree, your profession is not your main purpose in life. It is to help you. It is to make it easy for you to worship Allah, your creator, God Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Woman ahsanu qawlan. Who is better? Who is more excellent in statement than those who invite to Allah? And then they themselves perform righteous deeds and they profess, Innani min al Muslimin. I'm nothing more than a Muslim. Why did you stop your car and get out to help me change my flat tire? It's raining outside, it's cold outside. It's hot outside. It's dangerous. Everybody drove by me. No one stopped to help me change my flat tire. The person says, thank you so much. Can I give you some money? Can I do something for you? Can I give you a hug? Thank you so much. I'm nothing but a Muslim. And the only reason why I stopped my car is because I'm a Muslim. The only reason why I put myself in danger and I gave you my jumper cables or I paid for something in the airport because your debit card wouldn't work, whatever situation or scenario you get to, is because I'm a Muslim. Those of us who have traveled and have went to different countries, different cities, those of us who have become aqallul qalil, the least of the minority in the airport, on the airplane, you know the reality of this verse. When someone sees how well you're dressed, how clean you are, how kind you are, you held the door for that old woman and she says, thank you. She's an old Christian woman. She's not a Muslim. She's not from your country or my country. She's an old Christian woman. And she smiled and she says, thank you because you held the door for her. A good thing and a very bad thing. It's a shame that a woman has to be so exuberant about a man holding the door for her. In a time in our country, it was a normal thing. And if you weren't a gentleman, you were looked down upon. But it's become so strange, so weird for people to have basic politeness. So she says, where are you from? What's the name of your temple? What is this thing called? What is this called? Only Allah knows how many times we've been asked this question on a train, on the airplane, in the airport. Only Allah knows. And you say to them, in the name of Muslimin, I'm just a Muslim. That's it. That's why I showed you kindness. That's why I gave you this. That's why I said and I did what I did, because I'm nothing more than a Muslim. In other words, I'm nothing more than a transmitter of light. That's it. That's my job. The Prophet, والسلام, he tells in another authentic tradition, which makes it even clearer, even more lucid, even more plain. And that is the hadith of Sahl ibn Sa'd as Sa'di radiallahu anhu in Bukhari Muslim on the day of the battle of Khaybar when Muhammad alayhi and his companions went out to a battle and the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam he said لَأُعْتِيَنَّ الرَّايَةَ غَدًا رَجُلًا يَفْتَحُ اللَّهُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ He said tomorrow when we go out and when we put ourselves at risk and at danger, I'm going to hand over the flag and the banner to someone whom Allah will grant the Muslims victory therewith. A champion, a leader. And this man has the following two characteristics. Number one, he loves Allah and his messenger. Number two, Allah and his messenger both love him. And then the people, they begin to want this flag and want this banner and want this honor and want this nobility. And the people, they went to sleep, and the next morning they woke up, seeing which one would get the flag, get the banner, and be the leader in the battle. The Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, where is Ali? Where is Ali ibn Abi Talib at? And they said that he's sick, O Messenger of Allah, he's ill. Something wrong with his eyes. He has an ailment, he can barely see. He's of no shape to lead the Muslims in battle. 
He's in no shape to be the flag bearer. So the Messenger of Allah he said, bring him here. Tell Ali to come here. And then the Prophet والسلام, he performed something which was miraculous. Something that was amazing by Allah's permission. He spat in the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib ta'ala anhu. And instantly and immediately, Ali's eyes opened up. As if he had no ailment and no sickness. And then the Messenger of Allah والسلام, he gave him the banner. And he told him to do the following things. And he informed him about the following things. He said, go to them calmly and peacefully. Walk to them. Before you pick up your sword, before you grab your pole arm, your spear, your bow and your arrow, go to them and call them to Islam. The Prophet told Ali ibn Abi Talib to be a beacon of light. To try to rescue them, save them, deliver them, give them some clarity. And then he told him why he should be a beacon of light. And the virtue of being a beacon of light. And the importance, the responsibility. But as we said, it's not just a duty. It's not something that's burdensome, but it's something that's fruitful. If you do it, you will get fruit. You'll reap benefit in this life and thereafter. He said, I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرِ النَّعَمِ أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام He said, take this flag, go to these people, and call them and invite them. Because I swear, I swear by Allah, the one in whose hand my soul lies, if Allah saved one person, if Allah rescued one person, if Allah guided one person, five people, ten people, twenty people, this is a battle. How many people are on the battlefield? He may save an entire nation, an entire tribe, an entire clan of people. One man, if you guide, if Allah allows you to bring back to the truth, it is better for you than something we call in the Arabic language, humra naam. And many people, they translate this hadith to mean red camels. A red camel. Have you ever seen a red camel? Have you ever seen a camel in your life? Maybe some of you at the zoo. Maybe if you travel to New Mexico or Texas or some parts in which there are camels. But most of us living in the inner city or in the suburbs or the outskirts of the inner city, we don't come across camels, let alone a red camel. What is a red camel? Brown camel, white camel, black camel. If you've lived in the prophet city as I have, then you've seen all types of camels in other countries as well. But I don't think that this word red camel gives the hadith the true justice that it deserves. As if the Prophet والسلام, is telling him, if you're a beacon of light, if you guide one person, just one individual, it's better than you than the finest Rolls Royce. It's better than you than the biggest, largest, fanciest yacht. The most expensive, luxurious means of travel is better for you than a red camel, a beautiful camel, a camel that's pleasing to the eyes, that's strong, that can travel and is highly expensive. Brown ca camels cost a lot of money. White camels cost a lot of money. Camels that are in the middle cost a lot of money. But a red camel is the top of the top. In other words, the prophet is telling us, if you become a beacon of light, you're better than someone who's wealthy and rich. If you guide someone through your actions, through your statements, through how you dress, through your etiquettes, through your professionalism. The Messenger of Allah says, he tells us, that Allah has prescribed the ihsan for all things. Everything that you do, Allah has prescribed this word, ihsan. What is ihsan? What does it mean? To worship Allah as if you see Allah, that's only one of the meanings of ihsan. The Prophet clearly explains to us what ihsan is in this context. And I want to make it even clearer, but in the Ta'ala, he tells us, shafratahu." He says, when you wish to slaughter an animal, then you should make sure that your knife is extremely sharp. Sharpen your blade. This pertains to either adha, this pertains to offering an animal and sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Removing any pain, any suffering, and any damage to the animal, but it's bigger than that and it's deeper than that. What I want to tell you now, and what I want to conclude my speech with, being in Allah Ta'ala, my advice with regards to giving da'wah and being a beacon of light, whether it's through your words, if you're a good speaker, but if you can't speak, if you can just sharpen your blade, if you can go and be the best professional, the best in your field, get the best grades, the highest grades, be the fastest, the strongest on your team, work the hardest, practice the hardest, rest of the whole entire team, 
And that in itself represents Islam, and that's dawah, because you're sharp in everything that you do. What you say is sharp. What you do is sharp. You come somewhere, you go somewhere, you're on time. You do more than what you're supposed to do. You're the best professional. And when the Muslims, bathing in the night, get back to being professionals, when the Muslims show the non-Muslims that our religion teaches us to do the best and to be the best, no matter what we do in Islamic sciences and in worldly sciences. So we must never, ever forget and lose track of the reality of your purpose on life. When you work, you work, you make money. You provide for your mother, your father, your wife, your husband, your children. You give to your community. But the most important thing of working is to put forth an example and to show the people what we said in the Quran earlier, innani min al-Muslimin. Why are you such a great basketball player? Who taught you how to study like that? Who taught you how to be on time? Why are you so ethical? You never took anything, you never stole, you never did anything, you never cheated. I'm nothing more than a Muslim. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept all of your efforts, all of your good deeds. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the great throne, to reward immensely the principal of the school, the manager of the school, the director of the school, all of the teachers of the school, the brothers and the sisters. I ask Allah Azza wa to reward and to bless all of the parents for what they have put forth to allow these beautiful young brothers and these magnificent young sisters to graduate and be in the pass on in life. Last but not least, I thank my personal friend, Abu Anas Abdul Bari, and all of his brethren, all of those who work with him for inviting me here and allowing me to speak in front of you. Jazakumullahu khayran.